the one with NPIs? No, no. Uh, the one, but Pressing I, to resolve decision problems? Yes. No, no so I didn't consider that. So maybe that's because you're not really going to talk about context dependence. Yeah, and so also because, yes. It would be it would be quite extensive if we were to go there. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Is that, is no, I mean, I, what I see. I mean, go ahead. I, I'm just wondering because one of the issues is the type of answer, right? Yes. Exhaustive as opposed to mention some, mention all, and I don't see none of that why is there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you don't see why they are not on this list. Well, I don't see them on the list, and I'm right. so I figure you are not going to touch on that issue. Uh, not unless there is time at the end. I mean, I, so I actually have, I have some, some handouts on that, older handouts on that stuff as well, so we can talk about it, but... Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty in extensive and... Yeah, and okay, so um, I will pull up this thing now, this... Uh, screen and we'll just be talking from the handouts. I hope that's okay. We have handouts there. And so, uh, because I don't like having this in my bag all the time. So, in analyzing questions, the first question you have to ask is what a denotation of, a, of that kind of sentence should look like. Right? In semantics, we usually talk about truth conditions, that is the central notion um, at the heart of uh, the approaches to um, com um, declarative sentences and generally the way we represent propositions as denotations of sentences and so on. Now, uh, for questions, if we, uh, if you ask uh, what, what should the denotation of a question look like, it's quite clear that truth conditions don't really seem to play a role, at least not the same kind of role, right? Because it doesn't make sense to ask whether a given question is true or false. Um, so these things here in one, for instance, is it raining or who came to the party, who read which books, these very plain, simple, typical questions, it doesn't make sense to ask whether they are true or false. Okay. Uh, so that is the first problem that we have to address. Now, you, you may actually start then by taking speech acts to be the central notion because questions are used to request information, something like that, right? Uh, and so perhaps that's what you can say and uh, you know, flesh that out and uh, make that the heart of your analysis of uh, semantics of questions. And um, now, so the, there is a, a history to that, and you can you can see how questions affect the common ground. And uh, so some of the topics that come up here in the uh, um, in this overview of questions, you see in the bullet point on the 1.2. Um, so this is actually uh, clear, maybe part of what you thought about this context dependence, how questions depend on the context, and how they in turn um, affect the context. Uh, so that perhaps if you, if, you, if you have a way of putting that into a, a semantic theory, and you can say what, how the context changes when a question is asked, from before to after. Because for, be, before the question was asked, that there was no request in force, or whatever you want to say about these speech acts, and once it, it is asked, somehow the context has changed. And perhaps you can say something to the effect that now the listener is invited or under an obligation or something like that um, to provide the information or perhaps the speaker and the listener are committed to seeking the answer to the question, um, something to that effect. So you could uh, 
you know, try and say what happens when a question is put on the table, so to speak. People agree to pursue it. Um, and that is, that is an important part of the pragmatics, what questions do to the context. And these, uh, these citations that I have here in this first bullet point, um, they are some of the papers, of classical papers by now, all the ones that um, um, try to address it in those terms. Now then you also have to say what it actually means to answer a question, to resolve it, because uh, you know, that's, that's what, what was the central element of what I just said, right? People, the, the speaker and the listener agree to pursue a question and you have to say when it actually ends, when this, this quest has been successful, what they, are, what they actually try to do, right? When they try to answer a question. Um, and so, um, this is, this, for many questions, an approach like that might actually be all you need to say. So in terms of context dependence, what people try to do with questions, the kinds of speech acts they try to perform, um, that for, for many types of questions is the most, you might think, is the most interesting um, um, issue to pursue. I often will use the word question here, I just noticed you, you cannot really speak about questions without both mentioning and using the word question at many levels. Sorry about that. No pun intended. But um, and the problem with that is that it, it doesn't always um, actually play any role. There are questions for which this, um, this approach that I just mentioned just it seems irrelevant, especially embedded questions like those in two. John knows whether it is raining. Mary wonders who came to the party. Does Sue know who came to the party? That's a question which embeds a question. Right. Um, John, so John knows whether it is raining, for instance. We just had the question, is it raining, in one. And um, there it's true that when the speaker uses, that, uh, utters that question, that something changes in the context and then the speaker and the listener are somehow committed to provide information and that sort of thing. None of that plays a role here in number two. Right, so, um, now if we want to give it a, an account of the, the question itself, which is the same regardless of whether it is embedded under a verb like no, or a, in an interrogative sentence like, um, it, is it raining? then the pragmatic effect that the interrogative sentence hut, uh, has should not be the central element because if it's embedded under something like no, it doesn't do any of that, right? The speaker listener are not committed into, uh, to this sort of thing. There's no speech act um, going on in 2A other than an assertion if you utter the sentence. So, so what should the denotations of questions be? Um, well, the in, in terms of, when it comes to sentences, uh, plain declarative sentences, often we tell students, and the general assumption is that the meaning of a sentence can best be explicated in terms of what it means uh, to know the sentence or to understand the sentence, right? Now, to understand or to know what a sentence means is to be able to tell whether it's true or false. That's how truth conditions enter the picture, right? If you are able, if, 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 if you are able to tell of a sentence, um, given some set of circumstances, whether in those circumstances it is true or false, then you understand what a sentence means. So, this kind of algorithmic procedural view is behind that. For questions, perhaps we can say something like it, um, and the way it's usually spelled out is in terms of the answers to the questions. Um, to the questions. Um, so understanding or knowing what the question like 3a means, is it raining, is to know what counts as an answer to the question. 
what it would take to answer it. So that is the uh, central notion be, um, at the center of, of this approach. Okay, so in 3b, for example, we have two possible answers to this question. It's raining and it's not raining. And uh, so the, um, the knowledge that these two sentences in 3b are the possible answers to the question in 3a, that uh, gives us a handle on what the question means. Right? Because you know what the question means if you know that 3b are the possible answers. Um, okay, and th this is indeed at the center of the papers that we'll be talking about, these classics, the three different approaches to questions that are related but different. Um, Hamblin, one of the earliest writers in this tradition, says that the denotation of the, the question, it is, uh, is it, or it is raining, sorry, 3A should probably be, is it raining, sorry about that. Um, the denotation of that is 3b, is, it's these two propositions. Well, it's really just the denotation of these two sentences and not the sentences themselves. We'll see how that is spelled out. Um, Cartoonen says something slightly different. The denotation of 3a is the true member of 3b. So one of them is true and the other is false. We know that, right? We may not know which one, but uh, the denotation of it is the true one. So if you don't know which one is true, that's okay. Uh, then you don't um, you don't know what the denotation is, but the um, the uh, you don't know what the extension is, perhaps, but you do know what the intention is. Um and Stockhoff has also have something similar to say um, to Hamblin, actually, less so similar to Cartunen, that uh, 3a, as it says here, is interpreted with respect to a set of possible worlds. So you always need this set of possible worlds in the background. You cannot really talk about it in terms of just one single world of evaluation. Because what the question in 3a basically does is carve up the set of possible worlds. It draws lines between them. There are worlds where it's raining and worlds where it isn't raining. And 3A doesn't eliminate any of these worlds. It doesn't, doesn't actually, um, it, it doesn't change which worlds are in the set that we start out with. But it does draw a line between them, separating the ones where one answer is true from the ones where the other answer is true. Okay. And uh, so this is a yes-no question. Is it raining? It only has two possible answers. But then there are other answers, uh, other questions like these WH questions, who came to the party? And there we have, um, of course, a lot of possible answers depending on which individuals are in the domain. John came, Mary came, Bill came. And then we also have propositions like John and Mary came, Mary and Bill came, and so on. Uh, here there are a lot of issues that um, need to be addressed that we will actually not be going into because um, that's not something that we have time to talk about in this one day tutorial. You see here that for instance um, the proposition that John came and the proposition that John and Mary came they overlap, right? Because there are worlds where both are true. And so um, what I have here in 4b, that is actually, so the denotations of these sentences, they are not mutually exclusive. And so speaking in terms of drawing a line between the worlds, uh, doesn't really, um, it doesn't, it, it's, not, it's not really the right, um, uh, say, uh, the, the right metaphor to talk about uh, this kind of, this set of answers here. Um, and we can say more about this if there is time. Uh, it's an interesting topic, so um, we'll see how much time there is for this. Um, okay, and now this can also be extended to these embedded questions because whatever you, you know, um, whichever of these three approaches you adopt you have now at your disposal a semantic object of some kind. It's a set of propositions, a set of answers, a set of possible answers, a set of true answers, something like that. Um, and that can be made the, um, 
the, the semantic object that a, an attitude verb like no operates on. And then you have to say, of course, what no does with this, but at least you have something, you have uh, propositions. Um, and so then this is okay, because we have now said nothing about speech acts performed with questions. That's an entirely separate issue. We have a semantic kind of denotation. Now, uh, it's a separate question: What happens when someone actually utters a question? How these operate? How these? How these? Um, this denotation affects the context. So we'll be mostly talking about the semantic issue: how to represent questions, what their denotations are, and so on. Now here, the, so the context dependence that Cleo just mentioned and was missing on this is on this handout, even though it's not a topic of this tutorial, but you can at least see um, what a few of the issues are that come up when um, we try to dig deeper into this. So for example, this exhaustivity business in 2.1 here on page 3. Um, <coughs> so um, here's, a, here's a problem that has occupied people for a long time. What does a sentence like 6a mean? John knows who came to the party. It's actually, there, there are a lot of diverging opinions about this, and it's not clear if you think about the following. So uh, there are two possible interpretations for this in 6b and, and c. Uh, for each x, John knows whether x came to the party. That uh, is one way to interpret 6a. Look at 6c. For each x, if x came to the party, then John knows that x came. And if x didn't come to the party, then John knows that x didn't come. Well, actually, so, uh, this, is, this is pretty much the same as 6b. Sorry. Um, uh, now, the, the problem arises with the next bullet point in the next examples, uh, because there are some, some other ways of interpreting the sentence. So here's this scenario there. Are, um, Three people, Alice, Billy, and Kathy, A, B, C, they came to the party, suppose, and three other people didn't come, Wynonna, Yvonne, and Zelda, W, Y, Z. Okay. So three, the first three came, the next three didn't come, and suppose that John knows that Alice, Billy, and Kathy came, but he doesn't know that the others didn't come. He doesn't know whether the others came or not. Now, does he know who came to the party? I guess in a certain sense he does. I'm not sure if you have strong opinions about, intuitions about that, but uh, lots of people would say that that is all that's required for him to know who came to the party. But it doesn't satisfy the definition that the, 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 uh, these conditions that I just gave in six. Because there we say for every x, John knows whether x came to the party. It's only half. Well, I just said here for Alice, ba ba Billy, and Kathy, there's only half of these conditions. He knows of the people who came to the party that they came. But he, has, he doesn't know of the others that they didn't come. So in a certain sense, his knowing who came to the party is purely accidental. Right? He just happens to know of the right people that they came. And it's an accident. In the sense that um, someone else might have come and he, he, uh, he might have had the exact same information, but then we would no longer say he knows who came to the party. Right? Um, okay, so there are people who say that 6a is true, uh, sorry, 6a is not true in this case. John knows who came to the party. Um, and that's also what, for example, people like Roland Dijk and Stockhoff did in an influential paper. So, um, but if you said yes, then um, you are also in good company because that's what Kartunen would say as we'll see in, um, when we go through this paper, we'll actually see that he only requires the weaker version. Uh, that for those individuals of, which, of whom it is true, he knows that they came. OK, 
Okay, and then um, John knows who to ask for directions around campus. Now, this is this is related to the uh, mention all versus mention some issue that's mentioned here in the cut. That's listed in the in the section heading. John knows who to ask for directions around campus. If you use that on a sort of uh, um, in a natural setting, it's sufficient for John for John to know of one person that that person can give directions. Right? It's not required that he knows of everyone whether they can give directions or not. This is strong version in six, and even the weaker interpretation is not required that he knows of those who can give directions that they can give directions. Even that is not required. It's sufficient that there be one person of whom he knows that that person can give directions. That's the mention some answer. Right? Mention all versus mention some. You see why these labels are related to this kind of issue. right? Um, so, so this this question of so whether John knows who to ask for directions, somehow, well, uh, whether, it seems to depend on how much knowledge is sufficient in some sense, right? Uh, in order to get, to get directions, it is enough to know one person who can give directions. Um, And so this um, this goal that plays a role here that you know perhaps you want to get to some point on campus and uh, so if you get directions from one person that's enough. Uh, our assumption that that is the case plays a role in the interpretation of this sentence. John knows who to ask, and uh, the fact that we didn't think so in the case of John knows who came to the party, may likewise be just a purely pragmatic fact. Um, in this case, perhaps we have some other uh, purpose in mind, or some, some other uh, background question. Uh, for example, uh, you know, um, let's see. If you need to contact all the people who were at the party because there was a poisoned drink, or because the food was rotten, or something like that, um, then the sentence, John knows who came to the party, has a different meaning from a scenario in which, for instance, among the people in the class, you're, you're curious uh, how, what the party was like, and you would like to find someone who went. In that case, John knows who went to the party may be interpreted like seven. John knows who to ask for directions. I, I, I'm not sure, so I'm, I'm tossing this out. You don't think so? I don't think so. It's okay. still, it's still stronger. But then what is the difference between 6 and 7? This, this is I, yeah. it's a problem, right? Because both have this verb no, and both are quite similar in every other respect, but somehow, for some reason, 7 is weaker than 6, and the only difference is this, uh, weaker than I can think of is this kind of pragmatic uh, problem. What's the goal? What, what does John need to know this for? Does, does it have to do with the, with the presence of modal, like can, possibility? No, uh, maybe. Oh, that's interesting, actually. Not really. Uh, John, so, I mean, often, actually, I, I just realized that you often have a model. The standard sentence is John knows where you can buy, a, where to buy a, an Italian newspaper, right? But then John knows where they are selling Italian newspapers. All right, I'm not sure if there's a difference. If that still has the mention some interpretation. John knows where there's John knows where there is a shop where they are selling. John knows where they are selling Italian newspapers. Doesn't have a model. Does it have, does it as easily get the mention some? Interpretation as John knows where you can buy an Italian newspaper. I haven't thought about that so hard. It's interesting. I'm not sure. But you see, the, uh, this, this is a good point. But if there is something about the model, then I haven't seen 
an account that explains it in those terms. So maybe room for work on this. Okay. Now, but also if, uh, in, for, for direct, I'm, I'm using the term direct questions here. Um, and um, to <coughs> distinguish this from the embedded questions on the no direct question that the sense means ones that are actually interrogative sentences, uh, matrix sentences. Who came to the party and who can we ask for directions also have these two different interpretations. Right? And so we have to somehow explain what the difference and what's responsible for the difference. And so um, there is. There's a lot of pragmatics creeping into the semantic account, right? And uh, so th that's why a lot of theories of questions um, have the context built in in a very uh, essential way, and not just the context in terms of what the speaker and the listener know, or that sort of thing, as you know, common ground, that kind of thing, but also the context in the sense of what the speaker and the listener, or whoever else is involved, are trying to accomplish what they need the information for, what they're trying to do after the question is answered. Um, because, you know, that's, that, that's the best guess at what actually is the difference here, because that determines how much information is sufficient. Okay, but we won't talk about this topic a lot because it's a big topic. Um, and I should watch the time. When is this first? Oh, yeah, yeah. 11.40, so that's still, okay. So, uh, very closely related to this, the, 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 the issue of resolvedness, what it takes for a question to be resolved. This is really just um, now a, a different perspective on the same problem. What counts as an answer to the question? Um, so this is from Ginsburg, uh, who has written a lot about this. Um, so let's see, 9A, 9, 9 and 10. There's supposed to be a difference between them. Let's see if you can, if you agree. Uh, so the context is different. Jill is getting off a plane in Helsinki, and the flight attendant asks, "Do you know where you are?" Jill says, "Helsinki," and the flight attendant agrees. She knows where she is. Um, and if it's, if she steps out of a taxi, then taxi driver asks, do you know where you are? She says, Helsinki. Then the taxi driver would not agree that she knows where she is. Now, it's a tricky thing. It's not, it's, it's, these are very, sort of, what should I say, um, malleable intuitions, right? Um, and perhaps this is not very, it's not, these are not very hard constraints. Um, so it's not the case that, for example, in 10b, Jill doesn't know where she is whenever she is in a context like this. But somehow, it's just, if, if, you, if we think of sort of stereotypical ways, um, you know, what normally is the case when someone asks Jill, does she know where she is? Uh, perhaps, uh, so normally, the kind of information that is requested really differs between these two contexts in this way. So it's not a semantic difference, but it's again a pragmatic difference. Usually, in in context nine, Helsinki is a good answer. That's that's what she needs to know in order to know where she is. Whereas in ten, it's usually not a good answer. Like I say, not semantically wrong, but somehow um, there's well there is something wrong with it in the sense that um, the granularity of the uh, various answers differs. So if you're getting, if you're getting off a flight and the, the set of answers is different cities, different airports, something like that, places where the plane might have landed, right? Whereas in a taxi case, it's a different level of brain. You're looking at a, at a more detailed picture and your, your view is restricted to Helsinki but, and uh, then you need to know the streets and that sort of thing. Uh, so this kind of context dependence also plays a role in determining whether the question is actually answered. And likewise, if you get off the plane and ask the direct question, where are we, then Helsinki may be enough. But if 
you're getting off the taxi, then the answer Helsinki may be offensive or what, whatever you think about it, but it's not, not enough. Okay. Um, so let's see what else. Uh, this is. Um, yeah, like I said, this is, well, this is something we won't have a lot of time to get into. Uh, inquisitive semantics and pragmatics is something I do want to cover in the afternoon today. Um, let's, let's see what is uh, the issue here. I'm splitting this up here, number three, on page four now on the handout, in two parts, inquisitive semantics and inquisitive pragmatics, and they are really two separate aspects of this project that has been going on in, in Amsterdam for a while. Um, so one problem is we have these different different kinds of denotations. Questions don't refer to propositions. We just agreed on that. They are somehow, they refer to sets of answers or something like that. Partitions of the logical space, some, some object like that. But questions can also occur in compound sentences together with declarative sentences, uh, declarative clauses, and with each other as well. So 11 a and B are two perfectly fine conditionals. If the weather is good, Joe will go hiking. And if the weather is good, will Joe go hiking? They are not, uh, as in, in grammatical terms, there, there's, no, there's no difference in, in well-formedness between them. But usually the way we interpret the conditional is in terms of relating two propositions or two whatever truth values or something like that. right? Now, if a question doesn't denote that sort of thing, then we have to say something else about the conditional construction as well, not just uh, about the interrogative clause, but we actually need a different semantic analysis for the conditional. Because if there can be questions, then, uh, well, they have to be accommodated somehow. Uh, 12 is the same, and now here we have uh, WH, not a, not a yes, no question. If you have any questions, Joe can help you, and if I have any questions, who can help me? Perfectly fine, right? And so, yeah, that's part of the, of the uh, motivation between these. There are other kinds of sentences in 13, regardless of who wins, the match will be fun. Um, and conjoined questions, who is your father and who is your mother? You can conjoin questions like this, right? And uh, there are two, two more sentences. So who is your father? Who is your mother? Asking these two questions subsequently and getting the answers separately amounts to the same thing intuitively, right? I mean, it's, it's, so the question in 14a somehow asks for the same intuition, uh, for the same information as the two questions in B. And so, in a sense, knowing or giving the answer to 14a is the same as giving the answer to the two questions in 14b. So that uh, somehow has to play a role. If we want to modify our semantic analysis for the connective end, in such a way that it can also connect questions. And of course, I mean, this is, this is again the same, so this is, we request the same information as in 14c, although that is a different question altogether, right? Who are your parents? And that should somehow fall out that 14a is equivalent to 14c and 14b. So, so yeah, that's part of the motivation that questions occur in all these contexts and like I said um, if we want to account for these sentences then along with a different interpretation of the questions we also need a different interpretation of the connectives in, with which they occur. So the syntactics, I'm sorry about the syntax now uh, here I'm speaking of the syntax of the, of the logical language, the, the, the um, formal language that we use to talk about questions, right? That should somehow be extended if we want to get a formal semantic account of this, right? Because um, we need something which 
corresponds to questions in the natural language, English. Um, and the inquisitive semantics, that's in part the, what, what uh, people try to do there in that, in that area, that project. Uh, uh, that's not all though, there's this whole other issue of inquisitive pragmatics which has to do with this um, effect of questions on the context. So usually in dynamic semantics we try to account for the way in which um, an, an assertion of a declarative sentence affects the context or the speaker's listener's belief state, something like that, right? You hear that the sentence, you hear, you hear a sentence asserted and if you trust the speaker and all goes well, then you will end up with a belief state in which, which has somehow been updated with that sentence, in, in which you now believe the sentence. But um, so this kind of update of direct transmission of information is um, just one small aspect of what people do when they talk, when they carry on um, conversations with each other. Because there's a lot of sort of um, discourse management going on as well. People so ask questions, right, which somehow um, determines what comes next. And generally, two speakers have to agree on what they're trying to accomplish in their conversation, right? What uh, what, what, uh, what's the goal, right? Um, what the asymmetry in information is, uh, what is, what is required, that sort of thing. Now for that, the inquisitive semantics claims to make, um, to, to provide a model for um, representing that sort of thing as well, and it does, at least for part of this, of these things that go on there. Discourse moves other than just um, putting information on the table and transmitting it to the listener. Discourse moves like raising an issue um, or dismissing an issue, somehow trying to steer the conversation in a particular direction. That sort of thing is what people do. And um, so in here, in this, in this inquisitive pragmatics endeavor, um, the goal is to represent these, to model these activities um, right on the par with plain assertions, with uh, updates on belief states and that sort of thing. So not as some kind of meta or uh, um, second order or some other special kind of operation, but as one of the things people do. In addition to assertion, asserting um, information and uh, updating belief states. Okay, so we'll see some more of that uh, towards the end. And here are some, some more things that come up with questions. Now, um, we only have one more hour in this first session, so perhaps I, well, uh, I should be brief, but I would like to mention these things because they are interesting, if you don't mind, sir. Should we talk about these things, even though we won't read any papers on these topics, just to see what the data are that people are trying to address? So negative polarity items, for instance. Um, we know what they are, negative polarity items. Things like um, ever, in this case here, um, in 15. Uh, so we, and we also know roughly, um, we have Nice theories that work for lots of ex kinds of expressions of when they can occur. Nobody has ever been to Colorado. No, no, let's say nobody in this room, something like that, right? Of course, people have been there. Um, so, ever is fine there, but in 15b, she has ever been to Colorado is not good. Ever cannot occur in there. Um, he didn't lift a finger to help versus he lifted a finger to help. Now, in these simple declarative sentences, it's a, it's a very good generalization to say that these negative polarity items are licensed whenever the context is downward and tailing. Right? Is that, is that familiar to people, students here? 
think, yeah, okay. Um, so downward and tailing contexts of in friendly environments for these negative polarity items. And there's a lot of subtlety that this crosses over, but it's a good generalization for these purposes. And now they also occur in questions. Has she ever been to Colorado? Is a good question. Ever can occur in there, right? Did he lift a finger to help? Also a good question. Now, uh, the first problem you encounter when you want to say why they can occur in questions is that we haven't actually said what it means for questions to entail, to be downward entailing. Do question, what, what do questions entail? They don't have truth values or truth conditions. So that's the first thing that actually needs to be addressed if you want to even try this downward entailing account, applying that to questions. Now here, um, we, don't, we shouldn't perhaps dwell on this issue too long, but um, it's a fact that polar questions, uh, that is yes-no questions, are not downward entailing. So for example, um, have the students in this room been to Colorado? Well, I mean, we, perhaps we shouldn't, we shouldn't run on this because actually we haven't said anything about entailments between questions. But think of the, of the uh, relation between a question like, have the students in this room been to Colorado and have the female students in this room been to Colorado? Perhaps go there. <laughs> uh, has she been to Colorado and has she been to Denver? Um, let's not let's not talk about this uh, in detail. Oh. This is not downward entailing, yeah. But the thing is, I haven't actually said what entailment is between questions, and it will lead us quite far away. Um, WH questions like who has been to Colorado, um, the, you can show that they are downward entailing on the left argument, but not the, the sort of restrictor, which, uh, something like which student, um, on the student part, but not on the um, on the other argument. Now, the, the distribution of NPIs in questions what, uh, is not, cannot be accounted for in these terms. Um, and so here in this uh, literature on NPIs and questions, then people are wondering what about questions is such that these NPIs can occur. Um, <coughs> uh, so, now, if you think about what these negative polarity items do in questions, um, in 16, for instance, has she ever been to Colorado? If you compare that to has she been to Colorado? Or did he, lif did he lift a finger to help? If you compare that to did he help? Um, That's perhaps the first thing you should do. Ask yourself what the difference is because well, it tells you what the negative polarity item does to the question. Um, and so one hypothesis that people explore is that this, this negative polarity item this, in 16AB, these things, they introduce kind of, they are used to express a bias right, and sort of an expectation that probably the answer is no. Isn't there a difference between A and B in 16? I, I mean, Yes, for the strong NPIs, like lift the finger, you get the bias uh, implication, but I don't think that's true for 16A. I mean, yeah. unless you stress the average. Yes, so that's an intonation yeah. thing plays yeah. a role. Yeah. But have you ever been to Colorado? Have you seen anyone? I mean, there's just yeah. no bias in those questions. Yeah, so that's why I'm a little careful of saying this hypothesis people have. It's not. It's not clear that it's the, it, it works equally well for all of these. Yeah. But. But I think I, 
I think with the exhaust of MPIs and with the right notion of a logical, the right notion of impoundment between questions, you can get the AKs. You can think about that. No. Yeah. Uh, I'd like. Should we? Well, let's let's postpone it. Okay. Yeah. No. I just. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. So, um, but for the lift the finger case, it's pretty clear that that introduces a yeah, bias. Yeah. Strong um, NPIs. Yeah. 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 And so there are. The, the paper is cited in the last bullet point, especially the Van Roy 2003. That's why I thought it was what you were mentioning, but it wasn't. But it wasn't. That is all. This is about this sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, another problem that comes up with questions has to do with focus. Um, for example, in 17, John introduced Bill to Sue, where the uh, the bold-faced part is stressed. Okay, that's what we have. To Think about that. Um, as opposed to 17b, John introduced Bill to Sue, and C, John introduced Bill to Sue, something like that. Okay. Um, each of these is only felicitous in response to a particular question. Right. So um, there is something here on the next page. Um, in 18a, so I'm sorry, this is now on different pages. We have to go back and forth a little bit, but you can see that. Uh, 17a, for instance, um, John introduced Bill to Sue, is a perfectly good answer to 18a, who did John introduce to Sue, but not to the other two. Right? Um, who did John introduce Bill to? John introduced Bill to Sue. It's bad. So, infelicitous. Right? And likewise for the others. So, the, the ABC cases, they are good answers for the ABC questions, but not nothing else. Now, uh, but the sentences in 17, they don't actually have to um, follow these questions. Um, they can be uttered in contexts in which somehow that question is, for, for some reason or other, that question is uh, kind of prominent. That's what people are, what, what the speakers are exploring at the moment. Um, so they somehow, in, they presuppose that they require that the, the the correct question, the matching question, is somehow prominent in the context for some reason, either because it was asked explicitly or because it was it's somehow salient. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so this relation between answers and the questions that they are good answers to, that um, is very prominent in the um, literature on focus. And uh, if you think about it, depending on which question was asked, you get different sets of answers, right? For 18a, who did John introduce to Sue? You get the alternatives in 19a, where you have introduced as a predicate here, and then these three people, John, Bill, Sue, and then there are some alternatives that have John and Sue constant and differ only in having other values for Bill, right? But then the other two questions have different alternatives, and they all vary in the pieces um, that are stressed in the answer. Uh, so um, now, in this, so this relation between questions and answers is um, at the center of this work on focus as well, and. Um, we won't do. We won't go there. But um, this is just one of the topics that also come up. Okay. Uh, another problem with quantification, for instance. Which book did every student bring? Sentence twenty-two. What does that mean? Now there are different kinds of answers that may be required for that question depending on how you interpret it, depending on so different interpretations of the question are intended. Uh, it's possible to say every student brought Moby Dick, in which case 
the answer somehow assumes that there is a book that every student brought a copy of, right? Every student brought their copy of this book, Moby Dick. But the question can also the question isn't always answered well by this answer. Sometimes a different kind of answer is required. Um, every student, not read but brought, sorry, in 22b should be brought his favorite novel, where now the novel varies with the student. And you can also have what's called a pair list answer, where you simply have to enlist which, which student brought which book, and you have to give all these pairs of values. Um, now that um, you can see, so um, somehow the, the representation of the question and the you know the answers that are available, are the, they have to predict that they have to have the right range of denotations to predict this variation here. And then the other problem is that you have to have some account of what the context ought to be like in order for the required answer or the expected answer to be, say, um, 18b versus 18c sort of thing. Um, okay, but let's not uh, go further into that. Uh, quantificational variability effects, section 5 on page 7. When you have adverbs like rarely, or usually, or sometimes, as in 25, a man rarely loves his enemies, or a man usually hates his enemies, and so on. Um, a man sometimes loves um, his enemies. The, this indefinite somehow um, varies with or oh, well, it somehow depends on the adverb, right? Um, it's it's it, as, as it says here, it acts like a variable that somehow co-varies with the values of the adverb, right? And for WH phrases, you get something like that too. Sue mostly remembers what she got for her birthday. Um, the um, or 26b. No, Bill knows for the most part what they serve for breakfast at Tiffany's. Um, it seems like as in 27, 27a is somehow it looks like a good um, a good representation of that. For most x, for most things that they serve at Tiffany's for breakfast, Bill knows that they serve that for breakfast. Something along those lines, right? Where the, uh, as, it say, as, it, as it's here um, informally indicated, the X somehow is bound by this quantifier. And likewise for 26A, Sue mostly re remembers what she got for her birthday, so for most things that she got on her birthday, she remembers that she got those things on her birthday, right? So yeah. here it seems that the non instantiating answers are irrelevant. So if you realize, for the most part, realize who, um, who came, or you, for the most part, you remember who came. Mm -hmm. It's of the people who came, from most of them, you even remember yeah. what they gave. I don't think you get the stronger, and I mean, that is, the, the, the adverb of quantification does not quantify over the non-instantiating. Oh, it's, yeah, it's restricted right? to... So it's not like you oh. imply that for most, I mean, you oh, don't this, say anything I, I yet. Didn't. Oh, sorry, well, did I... I mean, did it's I, not I, that... Uh, no, it's just connecting it to the previous issue, right? Oh, oh. Not a really strong uh, implication. Oh, I see. Or not. Yeah. And here, it looks like it's only the positive answers. That's true, so yes. So there's, not, there's nothing implied that for... Yeah, for most for of the ones who've been... <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah. this is... 
This yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So that's what I mean by non-instantiating. Yeah. That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Yes. So the things of which it's false, right? Of, uh, the, no the, right. So, so Mary, yeah. Sue. It's, so twenty-six A does not imply that Sue remembers of any of the things that she didn't get for her birthday, that she didn't get that on her birthday, right? So not, nothing implied, you're right. So that's somehow absent, I, I don't know why. Somehow the quantifier may be responsible for that. Because if there's none, you get this ambiguity. Sue remembers what she got for her birthday. Well, we don't know, right? We yeah. don't, uh, I mean, so, the yeah. intuitions are unstable as yeah. to which, which conditions have to be verified. We agreed right? to, to leave that open, yeah. But at least the but here it's very clear. Yeah, so the problem arises when the adverb is absent, mm -hmm. but with the adverb it doesn't arise. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, and so here we have the embedded, uh, I mean, the, these are not interrogative sentences, but we have embedded questions, that's why this arises. Yeah. And so there's, there are these interactions between these adverbs and the, uh, the, the various answers to the questions. Uh, okay, I would like to leave it at that, because that's also the end of my list, although um, there are some issues that I didn't even touch on here, but I hope this gave you a good idea of what problems people have talked about. And so um, the, the, um, the readings listed here, the, the various papers in these, in these sections, they are good places to start to look for approaches and problems and so on. But we won't go into those. So we will, as I said, we will stick to some classics for the rest of the morning. We'll talk about Hamblin and Cartoonin. This may spill over into the next session a little bit because it's already 9. No, sorry. It's 9 p.m. in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> it's already 11. Sorry, yeah. Uh, we have, so in the, in, the, in the 40 minutes, we won't go through all of this Hamblin and Cartoonin. But it's okay. Now there's a handout on that. I'd like to start now looking at these very basic issues. How do people represent questions semantically? Um, like I said, there are these three classics, Hamblin, Kartunen, and then Kroendijk and Stockhoff. And perhaps it's good to say first that Hamblin and Kroendijk and Stockhoff are logicians, or were logicians. And not all that interested in fine linguistic analysis of various kinds of expressions and so on. Whereas Kartunen, for him, that was the, mo the main part. And you see that in those papers. Um, the, the Kartunen one is very concerned with sort of fine mechanics, whereas the others are more concerned with information and uh, relations between uh, denotations and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, so it's not to say that any of these are worse or whatever, uh, than the, or better than the others, but there's slightly, slightly different emphasis behind these papers. It's, I think that's fair to say. A Hamblin 58 is uh, basically usually cited as the beginning of this uh, particular class of approaches that we are talking about here. And uh, so the paper is there, you can get it in the back, but uh, let's just go through the main points that he has. So these postulates there, these are simple observations that may seem plain to us, but that are important in pinning down what the denotation of a question should be. First, an answer to a question is a statement. Now, it's not at all plain to see. This, is, this sounds trivial, but it's not. We'll see that in a moment. That this is actually a very substantive claim. Uh, knowing what counts as an answer is equivalent to knowing the question, or well, knowing the, what the question means. We already said that, and this is, I, this, is, this is pretty plain, but it's also hard to spell out, actually. And thir thirdly, the possible answers to a question are an exhaustive set of mutually exclusive possibilities. And that's a partition. So, you know, what it means is basically you have this logical space where, say, you know, we can think of this as a set of, set of worlds, usually the way contexts or belief states are represented. 
this is the logical space. And the various answers to the question, they are something like that. They, you know, these are the answers. There is no overlap. There is no world that is you know, in the, in the uh, notation of two answers. There's exactly one. And uh, so there's no world where no answer is. Uh, this, this is none of these uh, cells of the partition. So he introduced that idea which was very strong for a long time. Nowadays, it's, it's no longer, people don't take it uh, as a, such a given anymore that that's the case. Now, let's look at this uh, number one, the form of answers. Statement here, uh, he means a declarative sentence, a sort of thing that denotes a proposition or has a truth value. Okay, that uh, kind of thing. Now, um, so, um, you might have thought that that's not really the case. <coughs> that if you have something like um, who came to the party as a question and John came to the party as an answer, that came to the party is somehow not really part of the answer because you might as well just say John. And that's also good. Now, you have to make a choice there. So, the problem is John came to the party is a good answer. John is also a good answer. And you have to say whether either came to the party is redundant in the full answer or it's elided in the short answer. So, the problem is whether somehow underlyingly, semantically, it's there or not. Either way, you can say that people drop it or in include it, right? Uh, but you have to say, um, well, what its status is. Whether it's actually part of the answer that came to the party, which is simply repeated from the question. So there's, it's certainly not new information. And so there are different schools of thought on that as well. And this, uh, what, uh, what I refer here as a structured meaning approach. Um, I could just briefly say what that is. There, a question, the notation is not really a set of propositions or anything like that, but it's a function. So, for example, the, roughly speaking, the denotation of something like who came to the party is a function from individuals to truth values. So from so in the end for every so it's it's a question right um, and for each answer the question tells you whether that person came to the party or not and if you know that function then you know, right so you, you get the idea right? yeah. so you plug in these values and uh, you get full um, propositions. Uh, now there, you, you, could, you could really say that John is, is all that's required and uh, came to the party as redundant. But uh, Hamblin's case for saying that this is a statement is actually uh, quite interesting. In number one, you have uh, questions like this. In which continent is Luxembourg and in which continent is Ecuador? And uh, now, what are the alternatives here? What are the possible answers of these two questions? And you see that if, if uh, answers like Europe are enough, if those are semantically uh, Europe, Africa, Australia, if those are the answers to these questions, then they have the very same answers. Both of them have the list of continents as their answer. And if the set of answers is all there is to the meaning of the question, then they are equivalent. But they don't mean the same. They are not the same question. Right? Um, so, uh, if you say that, however, if you say that 
a set of answers is actually a set of propositions, full, fully fleshed propositions like in 2B, Luxembourg is in Europe, Luxembourg is in Asia, Luxembourg is in Africa. Now that, those things, they are different from Ecuador is in Europe, Ecuador is in this, and Ecuador is in that, right? And there you actually get something non-equivalent. So including all other material that turns your partial answer into a full answer solves this problem. That was Hamlin's reason for stating number one, and you, you agreed suddenly it look, doesn't look so self-evident anymore, right? Uh, because it, um, it's actually, number one, this an, an answer to a question is a statement, um, that solves a big problem, at least it's his way of solving, of addressing a big problem. Not that structured meanings are discredited for that reason, um, but it's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Um, okay, and number two, well, it's pretty clear, so now I'm on page two of this handout, um, knowing what counts as an answer, just keep in mind that that is different from knowing the answer, right, because, I mean, you, uh, in order to know what the question means, you don't, know, you don't need to know what the answer is, you only need to know what the the possible answer, what would count as an answer, right, if this were given and it would answer the question. Um, right. In order to understand the question, who came to the party, you don't need to know who came. You also, you only need to know that a sentence like John came to the party is an answer, right? Uh, yeah. So the partition thing. Um, now let's see. It's, we have already said something about exhaustivity, but let's let's actually say a bit more about that. Um, <coughs> Now, the, the first problem that actually Hamblin himself discusses here is that of presuppositions. As in three, have you stopped beating your wife? Now, this was written in 58, and it's not politically correct. Nowadays, people would say, have you stopped smoking, or something like that. Uh, but I, use, I just quote this, this example from the paper. Now, if you have this partition approach, then, you know, you have these different sets of circumstances, possible worlds. Um, the answer is yes in some set of worlds, and it's no in another set of worlds. Yes, I stopped beating my wife. No, I didn't stop beating, I haven't stopped beating my wife. But then there are the worlds where the person actually never did beat his wife. And there, neither of these sentences is true if you say that presuppositions are required for, you know, have to be satisfied for the sentence to have a truth value, then the sentence, neither of these responses is true in, on this set of worlds where the presupposition is not satisfied. So that's a third cell in the partition which is not actually an answer to the question. And so the two answers to the question are not exhaustive. And this is what he means by exhaustivity. They don't exhaust the space of possible worlds. There's something left over. And that actually has this, this is still, even now, this is a, a serious problem. What to, what to do with this, especially um, what, to, what to say about an answer like, I never have beaten my wife. Does that answer the question? Or does it somehow reject the question? Right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's certainly possible in response to three to say, I never did. I have, not, I have never beaten my wife. It's possible to say that. And it's a good discourse move, it's felicitous, but the, question, the problem is what it does. Whether it's an answer or a rejection. Or a, yeah. um, nowadays, in this uh, inquisitive semantics, uh, the terms are whether it resolves the issue or dispels the issue. Um, that's a, so, you know, there are subtle cases where it's not so clear, and we'll see some of that when we talk about conditional questions later on. Um, now, for what, what Hamblin did was, okay, well, it, he said, we need this as a partition, and so there are the two proper answers, and then the third one is 
somehow added to this as what he called a residual answer. Um, just so uh, we are sure that we actually have all the worlds accounted for. But its status is a little different from the others. It's just important to keep in mind. Uh, so if you fill this in as a residual answer, so to speak, but what he called it, then you can maintain the claim that questions are um, exhaustive you know, um, partitions of the logical space. You have to say something about these cases in any case. Now, um, this is just the first of these properties um, claimed in number three, um, that they are exhaustive. The answer is exhaustive logical space. The other thing was that they are mutually exclusive, that there is no overlap between the answers. And that is not uncontroversial either. Um, and it's a little misleading here because, um, it, uh, well, it's a, it's a tricky terminological situation because uh, what I'm about to say about this uh, mutually exclusive part, that's what is often referred to as exhaustivity in the literature on questions, but it's not the same as the exhaustivity that we just talked about. The exhaustivity that we just talked about is, is this. Do the answers cover the set of possible worlds? If they do, then they exhaust the logical space. Okay. Now, what do people mean when they talk about exhaustivity of answers in this other sense? Uh, what they mean is, uh, in, if you consider number four here, who has a copy of this paper? If the answer is John, now um, you might infer that John is the only one who has a copy of his paper. But that's not what's said. Literally, John, even the full sentence, John has a copy of this paper, is perfectly consistent with uh, Mary also having a copy of his paper, right? It's not ruled out by, this, by the sentence, John has a copy of his paper. Pragmatically, at least, though, right, uh, from, the sen from, the, from the answer of John, we tend to infer that John is the only one who has a copy. But you, I mean, we are all familiar with Christian pragmatics, and it's easy to see why that inference would follow now, if that is just a pragmatic inference, then it shouldn't be in the semantics. But if it's not in the semantics, and we say that 4b actually is an answer to the question, then whenever we have more than one person in the domain of individuals, the possible answers are not mutually exclusive, because the proposition that John has a copy, and the proposition that Mary has a copy, they overlap. Right? Because there are worlds in which both have a copy, and then both sentences are true. And if we say that both sentences, both John has a copy and Mary has a copy, are semantically answers to the question, then we cannot say that we have a partition. But if we, uh, just, I mean, there's two notions of answer, right? The answers that are taken to be the denotation of the yeah. question. And yes. the actual answers given yes. to the yes. question, and those can be totally different. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm, that's why, no, I'm actually, I, but I did say semantically answers, I, I said that at one point. Oh, that was, I, okay, yeah. maybe not in the lesson. Yes, yeah. yes, that's a good point. I mean, yeah, again, 4B, um, not only is it felicitous, it is also a partial answer to the question. At least you can rule out the case, the possibility that John doesn't have a copy of the paper. So it is, it provides information that's pertinent to the question. In that sense, it is, it is an answer, at least in, uh, sort of loosely speaking. But the question, so the problem here is, uh, should it be one of the cells in the partition? Hamlin was talking about the question actually denoting this partition of the logical space. And then the problem becomes that uh, if we count John as a copy, as one of the members of the, denotation, the semantic denotation, 
then the semantic denotation cannot be a partition. Whenever we have two individuals, and it's possible for them both to have a copy of the paper. Right? See that? Yeah, yeah, no, I see that. Okay, that sorry. I mean, uh, <laughs> because you're, no, all I'm saying you're still is looking. That, that, uh, I mean, dialogues like 4AB and Lucy's dialogue, they are don't tell us anything about what you can assume about the denotation of questions, right? Because you can have the hand in the story about having the set all mutually exclusive answers, mm -hmm. but that story tells you nothing about what you can give as a possible Yes, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer, right? yeah. And, and I mean, a possible answer could just be a union of some of the cells. Right. Uh, yes, well, I mean, this yeah, uh, but, uh, but that is actually... So it's very hard so, to motivate the intuitions yes. using those dialogues. But that is, well, that, what you just said, is the conclusion from this, I think. Uh, well, this is how I see the... I mean, actually, I may not say that here. Uh, but, I, yeah, so I, I, I totally agree, of course, with what you say. Um, uh, we have to, that, that, that's basically the conclusion from this kind of argument, that um, we have to distinguish the semantic answers, that is, the, the members of the denotation of the question, from the things that we can say felicitously in response to a question. So that is different. There are semantic answers and pragmatic answers, and you can say lots of things felicitously that aren't literally, strictly speaking, uh, answers to the question semantically. At least if you want to uphold the view that the semantic